Hey, what's up, YouTube? In this continuation of episode five in the GeoTracker series, I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys how I built this motor controller. So stay tuned. So I began off with that uh, IP65 enclosure and I went ahead and removed the project baseboard. The next shot you're going to see is just me laying out the critical components such as the PWM board, current shunt, contactor, pre-charged resistors, auxiliary relay, FRM-01 modules, and the auxiliary and key ignition fuse blocks. A bit speedy, but I'm just showing a time lapse of me uh, attaching all these components to the baseboard using just bolts and nuts. Nothing really complicated here. So here are all the components assembled. Now let's move on to the next step. These are the two fuse blocks that will serve as the power distribution points in the controller box. Here I'm marking and drilling the holes for the uh, two fuse blocks. They'll be mounted with bolts and nuts on the rear side of the controller box. I'm using these rubber washers on the back side to prevent any possible water intrusion into the controller box. After a Loctite was applied to the bolts, stainless steel nuts were used to fasten everything together. Next thing to do is to dry fit the whole controller baseboard into the box for the next step, which is to form the uh, copper bus bars that will link up all the terminals and various components. However, before I do that, I need to first drill holes and mount two pairs of these pass-through terminals that will serve as the input point for the battery and the output point for the motor. To drill the holes, I'm using an inch and an eighth hole saw, but not before obviously marking a location and also removing the baseboard to prevent any damage to it. Uh, each terminal has its own pair of rubber washers just to prevent any water intrusion. So the pair of terminals on the right are the motor output terminals, and then the terminals on the left are the battery input terminals. And uh, the bus bars on the PWN control board have been marked just to you know, make sure I don't make any mistakes. For the copper bus bars, I'm using 3 quarter inch wide by 1 8 inch thick C110 grade copper rectangular stock. It's not the best option in terms of copper grade, but it was available in my area. Now just a quick discussion about ampacity and the physical dimensions of the bus bars. So like I said, I chose 3 quarter inch by 1 8 inch copper bus bars, which would be, if you look over here on the chart, it would be the 20 millimeter by three millimeter classification. If you look on the right side of the chart, you can see that a single copper bus bar of that dimension can carry 225 amps DC at 35 degrees Celsius. Now, obviously any current that goes above that will heat the bus bar up until it would presumably melt. However, that is a much, much higher uh, current than what we will presumably be seeing for continuous uh, operation. So I'd like to see how this current uh, bus bar setup behaves. And of course I'll log down the temperatures that I see. And if we do need to install uh, secondary or even tertiary uh, bus bars, we'll just do that. Okay, back to the bus bar fabrication. So the way I made this was that I used some cardstock to uh, create little templates of the bus bars that I needed to make. And uh, since I don't have any automated machinery that could help me make these ones, I did the old fashioned way with a, you know, auto uh, punch and a hammer, vise, some heat, drill press, so on and so forth. So it wasn't exactly perfect, but it worked. And you'll just see the whole process here.
All right, that's one bus bar formed. I have five more to go. You can see it installed here between the battery input main terminal and the contactor terminal. Uh, now I'm just gonna kind of fast forward and show you guys how I made the rest. Here are the formed bus bars, but before I can use them, I do need to polish them and also make sure the mating surfaces uh, are nice and flat. So I'm gonna go ahead and just do that with a buffing wheel and various other sanding procedures. Here's the nice and polished end product. So we're gonna move on to the next step. Before I mount the bus bars, now by this point I have already dry fitted them. However, I still need to cut the uh, heat sink down to length and also create the mounting brackets for the cooling fans. A step I'm taking before I cut the heat sink to length is I'm taking these small strips of plywood scrap and just putting them in the heat sink vent fins and that way it will prevent the fins from collapsing when I cut the uh, heat sink transversely. Another thing I did was I also drilled holes in the heatsink uh, where it mounts to the uh, PWM control board. The mounting brackets for the cooling fans are made from these two strips of aluminum scrap that I had laying around, which are then bolted to four L brackets also made of scrap, which I'll show you just in a second, uh, which is then bolted to the uh, heatsink sides themselves. Here are the four L bracket blanks being cut out. Since the L bracket material is only 16th inch thick aluminum, I could easily bend it with my thumb. I also marked out and drilled the holes on the L brackets. The four holes on the side of the heat sink where the L brackets mount were also drilled at this point. I can now mount the heat sink and fan assembly. First, I mounted the two aluminum strips to the two fans themselves, making sure the wires were facing the same direction. I could then mount the L brackets to the two strips themselves. After that, I mounted the heat sink on top of the PWM control board. After that step, I could then mount the whole fan assembly on top of it. I made sure to use plenty of Loctite just to make sure nothing vibrated apart. Here is the heat sink and fan assembly dry fitted. I will make sure to clean up the ink before I'm done. Before I went any further with testing, I also attached the three throttle input wires. So before I continue uh, with the whole assembly process, I just want to talk about the throttle input, which is obviously very critical to the operation of the motor controller. So in our case, uh, we're using a PP6 type uh, throttle. However, it didn't work out in its uh, stock form for this specific uh, PWM board. And so I just want to talk about the setup and the modifications I made to this. That way we can actually go ahead and use it. The picture you see on the laptop over here, I'm gonna bring it closer to the camera. That is the appearance of the original PB6 type throttle. 
This is the appearance of, well, my modified throttle over here. So let me just talk about uh, what I did to modify it. The first thing I did uh, was that I uh, flipped around the origin of the swing arm over here. Uh, this will attach you uh, to my throttle cable. Now, originally, the resting position was on the left, right? So currently, uh, the resistance where the resting arm is right now is uh, 5,000 ohms. And then the resistance on the left is uh, zero ohms. Now that is normal to how most uh, DC motor controllers on the market operate. However, for this motor controller right here, it operates the opposite of that. So basically what would happen if, if I didn't modify this is that when my foot is off the pedal, like the gas pedal, right? Um, the car is just gonna drive away uh, versus when I step on the pedal, the car is not gonna go. So that modification was, was necessary. On the back over here, you can see the 5,000 ohm resistor. Like all, res uh, sorry, potentiometers out there, uh, they have three leads, which is the black one is uh, the five volt reference, the uh, red one is the return signal, and then the white alligator clip one is uh, the ground. For a lot of DC motor controllers out there, you only need the first two wires, but for this one, you need a ground, so it's pretty easy. I'll just go ahead and run a wire uh, from the ground to the main harness, right? Um, so let me just go ahead and show you the operation of it, right? In the back, you'll see uh, two red and uh, black uh, leads that lead to this uh, power supply here set to 31 volts. In the front, these two, uh, the red and uh, um, red and white leads go to a ATV starter motor. And then uh, these three leads over here go to the potentiometer. So if you look at the uh, starter motor over here, when I go ahead and depress the uh, throttle, let me show that again. So right now we're stopped. And there we're going. So that's basically how the uh, motor controller works. Obviously 31 volts is pretty low, but it's a good way to verify the operation of this. So let's just go ahead and continue on with the assembly. Before I finished with the rest of the controller box, I had to first solder on the extra white ground wire onto the potentiometer box. I'm time-lapsing the assembly process for the controller box because it is tedious and just involves a lot of wiring. Uh, rest assured, I just followed the same wiring diagram that I created originally with a few modifications, which I'll discuss later. Uh, I just didn't want to bore you guys with just going step by step with the assembly. All right, so guys, I finished building up the rest of the controller and also wiring it, of course. And uh, I just wanna show you guys how this operates. So uh, currently, if you can look in the back over here, you can see that there's a bundle of wires that exit out of the motor controller. Those go to various uh, signals or power sources such as the battery uh, supply or the shunt meter or the key ignition uh, power, right? So just uh, before I discuss that, just take a look at this controller and to all its beauty. Okay. Currently I have this hooked up to the starter motor you saw from before. Uh, the potentiometer throttle, a 12 volt auxiliary battery, which will of course represent the car battery, and a DC linear power supply, which will represent the high voltage traction battery. Um, on the left over here, you can see the uh, high voltage traction battery uh, terminals. On the right over here and also on the front, you can see the um, motor output terminals, positive and negative, of course. And uh, I did make a few changes to the design of this that wasn't in the wiring diagram just as I went along and built this. So the first thing I did was, if you look over here, you can see a little uh, LED light. So when I turn on the key, 
uh, it will supply power to this light and then this light will glow on of course and it's a really good uh, safety measure because well obviously it's a cool visual that uh, you can see the red light when the key is turned on however um, if your key is off and this light is on then you know something's wrong uh, the second modification I made was if you look at this uh, four pin relay right here um, so this basically, uh, what this does is when I turn on the key, I'll activate this relay and it'll allow the 12 volt auxiliary battery power to flow through this relay and then into this uh, fuse block over here. Um, this is because, well, when your key's off, I don't want any battery power, be it 12 volts or, you know, the high voltage traction battery um, voltage to be in here. This will, you know, possibly drain the battery a little bit. So that's just a good safety measure. Um, this fuse block you see over here, this is the uh, key ignition uh, power fuse block. And uh, everything else is just basically, you know, as it was in the wiring diagram. So when I hook up this alligator clip to the negative terminal of this battery, this will represent me turning on the key. And then you can see how everything uh, operates. By the way, for the wires that are exiting out in the rear, as we saw over here, the only thing I haven't done yet is to put those wires into it, uh, your standard automotive type um, waterproof connectors. And uh, that's because if it's in the connectors, it's kind of hard to uh, you know test all this out. So I just wanted to show you guys before I do that. And uh, one of the reasons I want to show you guys is because yes, in the last episode, I discussed how several of these uh, you know significant components work alone. But I think it's a really good visual and really help you guys understand this whole assembly. If I test it out with all the components together, and uh, it's a really good visual, of course, too. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, hook up this uh, the well the negative lead, and uh, just take a look at the relays, and you'll hear some clicking sounds. So what just happened there, when I first hooked it up, uh, these two uh, relays activated and also the pre-charge resistor uh, relay activated, right? And after five seconds, as I discussed in the last episode, the pre-charge relay uh, disconnects and then the uh, contactor relay turns on. So like I said before, the high voltage traction uh, battery is represented by this DC source, right? I'm gonna go ahead and turn that on. And of course, uh, you know, this whole thing is turning on. So in its uh, non-active state, you can see that's drawing 19 milliamps, right? Um, when I go ahead and uh, depress the throttle, this motor should turn. And of course, this whole thing's operating as it should. So let me go ahead and do that. Once more. And something that you guys don't see here because I don't have two linear uh, power supplies is that this whole thing, uh, it draws 0.8 amps uh, when it's just running. Uh, when it first starts up, it actually surprisingly, there's no uh, significant amount of inrush current. It draws about uh, 0.7 amps, which is, like I said, very surprising, right? Um, so this does not draw much power and on the auxiliary battery, it's not gonna drain it that much. So this wraps up this episode. And uh, on the next episode, we're gonna go ahead and show you, uh, you know, this uh, motor controller in the vehicle itself. We're going to test it there before we actually implement the full assembly. So that wraps up this episode. If you guys have any questions or anything, just leave a comment in the comment section below. And if you haven't already, please think about subscribing to this channel. I'll see you guys.